นะโมทัสสะบาคาวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะบาคาวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะบาคาวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทธัสสะปุถังธรรมังสังขังนมัสสะมิขณะนี้เราจะลุมพอสมัยโตอันทอลจีซีดส์ออฟอันดัสแตนดิ้งนี่คือภาคไฟของการถามคำถามของโรเจอร์ถามคำถามของโรเจอร์ในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็นอาบัตในความเป็น The feeling that it's just a nice, comfortable life. And Paul responds, "Well, it's not ex not exactly a comfortable life." So this is 1981. Chidhurst didn't even have a shrine room at that point. We uh, the, what's now the reception room there? That was that was the shrine room. The house was filled with dry rot. Uh, the nuns were in the little cottage uh, down by the lake. Um, I think they were in the process of converting the. Uh, the fishing shed to be a shrine room. <laughs> It was a pretty basic, pretty basic accommodation and uh, amenities, and so that um, uh, Lumpur was not exaggerating, saying it's not exactly a comfortable life. We were sort of uh, during that that period when we were clearing out the dry rot. There was a certain point where you could stand in the basement and see through the tiles uh, to. Uh, Uh, you know, see the the uh, sunlight coming through the roof, you know, through the from the basement, through the ground floor, first floor, second floor, and up through the the tiles of the roof, so that the the whole house was a building site for a, a long, long time. So uh, the Lumpur is not uh, overstating the case that it wasn't particularly comfortable. Well, it's not exactly a comfortable life. In England, the problem doesn't lie in sinking into a routine because there's no tradition there to sink into. It's new and fresh, so it's not the case that one can really sink into anything. In England, there isn't the security that there is in a Buddhist country. Life as a monk in Britain is risky, chancy. It's not guaranteed, so one needs to be much more alert. Whereas in Thailand, one can take things for granted because life as a monk is so established and secure there. All one can do is to encourage and keep reminding people, because they forget. But how they develop is really up to them. As they say, you can take a horse to water. Dot dot dot. That's all one can do. And Roger responds. Yet for some people, there might be a gap between their own tendencies and inclinations and the ideology that they are following. How can that gap be bridged? And Paul responds. That's why one has to allow people space. That's the real value of the monastic life. One has to allow people the time and opportunity to develop, rather than expect them to make great changes all at once. Some people understand immediately. For others, it'll take years. That doesn't mean teaching only the ones who understand immediately. They don't need to be taught very much. In the monastery, one can also provide a place for people at least to live a good life in a wholesome way. Eventually, something will filter down to them. At least, it's good karmically. One isn't doing any harmful actions. That kind of environment encourages one to do good and refrain from doing evil. It's a moral environment. The emphasis is on paying attention, being alert, and watching, confronting one's life as one experiences it, looking at it, and learning from it. How determined and resolute one is in the practice is an individual matter. Some are very quick, 
Others are very slow. Some are neither quick nor slow. In the monastery, one can allow for the fast and the slow. It's not that one is selecting only the best, the quick ones. The advantage of having a monastic community is that it gives many beings the opportunity to develop. Some may not ever be enlightened, but at least they can develop harmlessness in their lives. Well, this is a, a very um, a significant principle and uh, has been part of the mix of, of Buddhist monastic life training ever since the, uh, the earliest days in the time of the Buddha. And uh, in, the, um, in amongst the many lists uh, in the, the Buddha's teachings, uh, you have one particular list that talks about um, the different uh, experiences of practice. One is quick insight and comfortable practice, and there's quick insight and painful practice, and there's slow insight and comfortable practice, and slow insight and painful practice. <laughs> so you can write your name in wherever you feel you particularly, <laughs> what you can identify with. Um, uh, and uh, another uh, another one, um, uh, a, a kind of uh, assessment of the different um, propensities or different uh, potentials or skills that people have in, in monastic training, spiritual and spiritual training. Then uh, when the Buddha was talking with a horse trainer called Casey, then... Uh, the, uh, they're talking about the comparison of training people in spiritual life and training horses. And um, the, the Buddha asks Casey, the horse trainer, um, uh, you know, how do you gr grade the different kind of horses that you, that you train? And he said, well, there's, there's really four different kinds. There's the kind that, that moves at the shadow of the whip. You just you lift up the whip, and as soon as they see the shadow of the whip passing their eye, then they're ready to go. Uh, the, the second type, you know, you touch them once with a whip and then, they, then they're, they're ready to go. And then the third type, you have to whack them a few times and then they're ready to go. And then the fourth type is no matter how much you, you hit them, they're, they're not going to go anywhere. Uh, and um, the Buddha said, yep, <laughs> it's exactly the same in the monastic life. And that, um, that's, uh, that's, and that's how it is. And uh, the, um, the, uh, that I feel is a, is an important part, uh, say part of our understanding is that sometimes things go quickly, sometimes they go slowly, and also it's not just. I, I would say from from my experience in, in monastic life, it's not just that um, you know you're uh, say one who learns quickly and it's painful forever, but it can be that, or, or one learns quick, quickly and it's easy, or one learns slowly. It can be that you have a few years of learning really, really slowly, just like seeming to get nowhere, and suddenly things fall into place and it becomes, you know, things get very, very clear, very fast. Other people, they can uh, learn very quickly and have a, a lot of insight just in, in the first year or so, and then they just hit a plateau and and it uh, and feel like they're completely stuck and there seems to be no progress at all so it's it's very very variable and so um one of the the, the hallmarks of both lumpo sumedo's teaching and lumpo Cha's uh teaching and approach is don't uh, don't be too quick to judge yourself in terms of of progress or, or lack of progress or how difficult it is or how easy it is it's very uh, uh, it's it's very simple it's very natural to to misjudge things, and that you because you, you can have a lot of insight very quickly and think, "Wow, that was easy." <laughs> okay, downhill from here on, and then you realize it's it's really downhill. You know that uh, you've uh, you make assumptions about where you're at, and then you don't pay attention to all sorts of co uh, complications and defilements uh, arising. Or it can be at the other end of the spectrum. You can say, oh, I'm no good, I'm useless, I'm not getting anywhere, uh, I'm, really, I'm really terrible at this, what's the point, yeah, I'm not improving at all. And then you, you make that comment to someone that, that you're living with and they go, are you kidding? You know, <laughs> you're, uh, you're so much more you know, wise and helpful and easy to live with than you were you know, five years ago, ten years ago. You know, you know, what, what are you talking about? You're, you're, um, you're uh, from the outside. You're, you're doing really, really well, and we really appreciate the, having you around. So appearances can be deceptive, and the way we judge ourselves and the way we judge other people can be really deceptive. So um, that um, oh, this is one of the areas where Lumpur Cha's 
dictum of mein Herr, it's not a sure thing. <laughs> don't don't uh, don't judge too quickly. Don't don't uh, take fixed positions about about yourself or others. But yes, just uh, and as uh, again as Lumpur Chah would say, uh, if it, if it's uh, uh, if the practice is easy and comfortable, keep practicing. The practice is difficult and painful, keep practicing. That it's a um, uh, it's important not to be uh, too strongly influenced by those. Uh, by those superficial uh, appearances. I remember there, there's also a, um, I remember many years ago, uh, Lumpur Panyananda was giving a talk here, that along with the, 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 the four types of horses, they also talk about lotuses in the scriptures, that there are some lotuses uh, are born and, and stand out of the water and blossom with the flower, uh, clear of the water. Some lotuses uh, uh, are born and the and the the blossom flowers on the surface of the water. Some um, uh, some are, are are born and then they they flower uh, yeah, uh, underneath the surface of the water, and then and then Lumpur Panyananda had this very very kind of even tone of, of uh, the way he spoke, and he said the fourth type, turtle food. <laughs> And there was a, so a ripple of of, uh, of laughter went through the. He was giving a dhamma talk in the sala. And he had this completely sort of even expression, turtle food. So, but uh, again, we can think, oh, that's me. I'm turtle food. You know, I, yeah, but um, I think that uh, is a. Um, uh, it's good to see how the mind makes those judgments, but also that. Um, that they even in the Buddha's time, he could see that some people were around at the monastery and they they would show up for things, but they really weren't learning. They're just so filled with their own opinions, their own rightness, their own um, you know, their own uh, habits, and and um, just uh, there was no uh, no room for them to learn. Lumpur Chah would say it's like trying to pour uh, pour water into a, into a glass that's already full, and. Um, and so that uh, when uh, when the Buddha asks uh, the horse trainer Casey, well, those fourth type of horses, the ones that uh, no matter how much you, you you hit them, they they don't go. What do you do with them? And then he, the Casey says, "Well, we kill them and then just use them to feed the dogs with." And then he asks the Buddha, "What do you do with them?" And the Buddha said, "I kill them too." He said, "But venerable sir, surely you know you." <laughs> It was inappropriate for you as a monk to, to take the life of your monks. And he said, uh, I killed them in the spiritual life. And they said, well, how do you do that? And it's, and it's a very, it's an unusual expression that the Buddha's using there. And he says, I don't offer them admonition. That uh, they are, you know, they're so filled with their own opinions, their own uh, uh, obstinacy, and uh, they, they can't learn. So the, the way that uh, he quote unquote kills them in the holy life is to not give them instruction, to not give them admonishment. And that itself is, I think, is a really important teaching. It's like, okay, you're so right, you're, sh you're so sure of your own goodness, and you, you're so sure that you've got everything sorted out, and you, got, you can't get anything from anybody else, fine. You're on your own. And uh, so it, it, uh, I find that's a very sort of powerful, powerful message in its own right. And... Uh, that uh, and that's how the 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 Buddha would relate to people who were you know, really unable, unwilling, uh, and uh, incapable of learning. It's like, okay, well, off you go. It's uh, it's your own business, uh, and um, that uh, um, uh, it, it also shows us how how important it is for us always to be ready to learn and not to be filled with our own rightness or our own. Uh, our own uh, views and opinions, our own habits, our own our own judgments, and take our um, say our own perspective of things as being absolutely true, and, and that um, no matter what anybody else, what anybody else says to you, then your response is yes, but <laughs> yes, but yes, but, and uh, and so sometimes it can be that way. I mean, in my own experience, I think I, I can only think of one or two people where I've really just said. I'm sorry. I just I, I can't give you any more time. I just there there is there's no space there. You know you, you keep asking these questions, but everything I say, it, you just respond by yes, but there. So you know I, I'm not trying to be stingy or unfriendly or uncompassionate, but I've got other things to do with my time. There's the door. 
And I, I really, I've only done that maybe two or three times with two or three people over the years. But the sometimes, and it's really an echo of that same thing. It's like, look, there's, <laughs> there's no space there. You know, there. So, you know, you're, you're on your own. And uh, it's not pleasant to do. Uh, it's not uh, something that one relishes at all. But it, it also, it's, it, it's, it is its own message. So sometimes that's the appropriate way of uh, relating to situations. Anyway, to continue. So Lumpur carries on. In Thai monasteries, very heavy, quote-unquote, people sometimes become monks, criminals and the like. For them, monastic life is a refuge where they're encouraged all the time to do good. Whether they attain enlightenment or not, who knows? At least it's a more skillful way of dealing with, with these types of people who have enough faith to become monks than to lock them up. Some monks talk about their past, which can be, which can be quite shocking. When one asks them why they are monks, they answer, I have faith in the Buddha's teaching, and it's the only way that I can break free from my old ways and habits. In worldly life, they tend to get pulled back into their old patterns. Roger then asks, you wouldn't think then that a community of monks, would, uh, sorry, you would not think then that a community of monks would be like a crutch or bondage preventing a person from growing. Lumpur responds, no, anything can be a crutch or bondage. It all depends on whether one uses it or leans on it. People think that having crutches is bad. Crutches themselves are not bad. Sometimes we need them. Imagine saying to a newborn baby, you have two legs, get up and walk. I'm not going to pick you up, feed you or do anything for you. You're in the world now. You've got to learn to take care of yourself. A baby is just not ready for that yet. Understanding the situation, one feeds it, takes care of it. One wouldn't say as soon as the baby starts crawling, if you depend on crawling, you're going to crawl for the rest of your life and never get anywhere. Get up and walk. The baby cannot do that. The baby isn't ready, isn't strong enough. By crawling and waving his arms and legs, pulling himself up on his chair and having his mother take his hand, he develops strength and grows until it's time to take his first step. Naturally, when he starts to walk on his own, he doesn't want to use crutches anymore. When children learn to walk independently, they throw away their crutches. They don't want to hold on to their mother's hand anymore. In the spiritual path too, crutches and refuges are sometimes deliberately provided for strengthening. When one is strong enough, one starts to walk independently. Roger responds, he gave the analogy of a baby crawling, developing slowly, gradually. A person who is within the system, just conforming to the pattern of it without really digging in, how can that system or organization help to shake him out of the rut he's in? Sometimes I feel it's necessary to make a break for the sole purpose of shaking up what can be a complacent lifestyle. Umpur responds, life itself is ever-changing. It's not that structures and conditions themselves change. Some monks have to disrobe and leave. Some find nothing in it for themselves after years and seek something else to do. All that one can ask them to do is to try to be as honest as possible about their intentions. Each individual has to work out his own life. If someone feels he's had enough of monastic life and wants to go another way, that's quite all right. It's his choice. But one should be honest about one's intentions rather than just using an excuse. That's important. The only thing that isn't nice to hear is when someone leaves the monastic order but isn't honest about why he's leaving. One may justify one's leaving by criticizing the tradition, but sometimes people leave owing to justifiable, serious doubts. So also it's notable that this, uh, he's talking about monks all the time and hardly mentions nuns, if at all. Uh, this was 1981, so I think Ajahn Chandasiri, you'd been in robes about less than two years? Yeah, about. So the, uh, there was, uh, I think Chintamani was in with you by then? Yeah. So there was all in white, so there was only four or five Anagari cars in the community. So, And then when Lumpur Sumedha was living in Thailand, the, the monks community in, in the Thai monasteries is completely separate from the nuns community. And I, I remember Lumpur making the comment that he, uh, he couldn't remember having 
had more than one or two conversations with a nun in the 10 years that he lived in Thailand. And I think that was probably with Sister Kumfar, who was an American nun. <laughs> but the, uh, I think, I don't know whether he ever had a conversation with one of the Thai nuns at Wabapong over, over all those years. So it's, it's a very, very separate and different uh, pattern of life than we have here in, in the West. So when he, uses, when he uses monks, and we're talking about monks' life, I think it's good to just translate that to refer to everyone in monastic training but uh, at that time it was very much a um, uh, his experience and, and uh, his his own sort of monastic environment was was very much um, tied up with the male monastic community um, so then going to that um, so yeah the, the Sila Dara community that was founded two years later wasn't it summer of 83 So that uh, that was still uh, to uh, to arise in the world at that point. So it was a, a long time ago. But I feel just uh, um, on this this particular point about people choosing to leave the order, um, it's one of the, the things that um, I feel is a strength of the uh, the, the Theravada tradition. It, it's 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 changed a bit in in some countries, like in Sri Lanka. It's quite. A disgrace for people to to leave the monastic life once they've picked it up, but in uh, other countries like Thailand and Myanmar, and Cambodia, Laos, uh, uh, the other Theravada countries, uh, it's quite natural for people to join the monastic community for a time, to live in the monastic environment, and to step out of it if it if it doesn't work for them anymore. And I've I've always felt that's a uh, that's a very healthy system. Um, speaking with various uh, Christian monastics, so it's less the case now where it's easier for people to leave monastic life. But back in the these early days, or sixties and seventies, uh, in that era, and and obviously the the centuries before, for a Catholic, a nun, or a monk, you actually had to get a dispensation from the Pope in order to to leave monastic life. It changed with Vatican II in 1968, I think. But prior to that, it was really um, uh, uh, very, very hard to leave the order. And I think in Orthodox Christianity, very similar, very, very hard to leave. But what you, you find is that, um, that in this way, people don't get trapped in monastic life, that they, 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 uh, they're not sort of there because they, they have no way out, um, but they can leave with good grace, as and when the, 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 the situation no longer works for them and uh, it doesn't prove to be a, a beneficial and a valuable environment. And, um, but I, I would also echo what, what Lumpur says here um, about being honest about why you're leaving. And uh, so that, that's always a bit trying when somebody is uh, uh, trying to make out that it's um, some kind of uh, much sort of higher spiritual calling for them to leave the monastery life. And, um, and uh, you know, it's, not, it's not the case for everyone. And as Lumpur says, sometimes people have you know, genuine, justifiable and, and serious doubts. And I'm not trying to, to mock people at all. But sometimes when someone's leaving and they're trying to make it sound like um, they are uh, say f following some higher purpose, and you really know that uh, sort of underneath the, the, the surface, they're just... They just want to go out and have supper, or have a relationship, or just they want life to be a bit more colourful, and that, uh, and they just can't say that. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> uh, and that um, you think. Well, and sometimes when somebody says, um, like, uh, uh, "I've been, I've been doing this for, for 15 years. I feel like I'm in round 45 of a boxing match. Can I, can I go now, please?" <laughs> I mean, yeah, isn't isn't the fight over? I've been knocked down so many times. Please, can I uh, can I just go? And you think, yeah, of course, fine. No, you know, they're just tired of of getting knocked over again and again and again. And and um, and this, I just can I just do something different? I just I'm just tired. You know, this this isn't working, and I just I just want to go. And so, when somebody is very honest and straightforward in, in that fashion then you feel very, very supportive of that. And so it is more difficult when someone's trying to make all kinds of, of reasons why it isn't really just um, anything very mundane or worldly, but they're sort of, their mind goes into a, a lot of complication and self-justification and, and, uh, and that makes it uh, a, a more uncomfortable leaving.
So anyway, I'll, I'll pause there for a bit and um, ask if there's any questions or comments. Uh, there's some the microphones available. Oh yeah, there. so please, if anyone has anything to ask or to to comment on that first part, don't be shy. Venerable Nirindo. Um, the first paragraph of what you just read, would you agree with after 40 years what that Longpo said? It's not that comfortable. It was, it was mm -hmm. not, not quite comfortable, and you were sort of explaining how Chithurst times were. And now we are 40, it's 40 years now, I think, later. Will that, you say, still apply, or would it be slightly different? How would you see it? Um, yeah, it's, it's slightly different. I mean, it was both physically uncomfortable because we were living in a building site. I think the nun's cottage is a bit more cozy. Bit <laughs> it was kind of cold and damp down there, wasn't it? <laughs> right down by the, by, the, by the riverside. It wasn't falling down, yeah. But it was also, it was, I think it wasn't comfortable insofar as um, you're, you're, you're a very new thing. Most people, when they would see us around and about, would assume that we were part of the Hare Krishna movement. Uh, or, uh, and that uh, Buddhism was really not a known thing, meditation was, was not a known thing. Um, and so that, uh, as Lumpur says, yeah, um, there isn't any, it's not the case one really can really sink into anything, it's new and fresh. Yeah, life as a monk in Britain is risky, chancy. He'd only been there since 77, so that was four years. Yeah, less than four years since they'd moved from Thailand, so it was still like, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? They'd moved out of London into this decrepit Victorian mansion in the countryside. Um, you know, in, in this era, um, the the English Sangha Trust was not as well uh, uh, supported. That there were times in this era where uh, the English Sangha Trust actually borrowed money from the cat donation tin. Doris was the cat. And there was a little tin for people who put uh, money for cat food. And there were occasions when the English Sangha Trust borrowed from Doris's cat food fund in order to purchase uh, building supplies or paint or such like. That did actually happen. So, um, yeah, it was risky. <laughs> it was, uh, it was uh, unsure whether it would, w w it would work. And also, um, now, um, Buddhism has got quite a... A, a good reputation is quite um, highly regarded. Meditation, you have sort of government programs encouraging mindfulness and meditation. You know, you had this um, Mindful Nation UK was a, 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 a um, cross-party government paper that was published encouraging um, development of mindfulness trainings in, in schools, in businesses, in uh, in the medical profession, and in the in the criminal justice system. And they had 20% of the um, uh, members of parliament signed up for that. So um, it was uh, including some government ministers. So it, that's gone from being a sort of, not exactly lunatic fringe, but <laughs> definitely fringe players in society to being, yeah, how much more mainstream can you get than the houses of parliament? I mean, it's like that... Um, uh, that's a very, very significant, and um, the, uh, the the general reputation of, of Buddhism. People n nowadays, rather than than uh, people assuming that you're a member of the Hare Krishna uh, community, often the, these my experience has been that they'll recognise that your robes mean that you come from Thailand. That the, they'll even say, "Oh, you know, were you a monk in Thailand?" Just from the way that we're wearing our robes. And so that, it's definitely puts its roots down into the society. And that um, uh, it's still um, f uh, out on the fringes somewhat, but uh, it's more and more part of the, the fabric of, of the British of way of life. And that, um, uh, so that, it's a bit more possible to be uh, complacent. You still get a few looks if you walk through Berkhamsted and Hemel Hempstead. You know, people 
still uh, might look at you and wonder what you are, but that, that's that's less the case. So to me, and I've often said this, I think we're still in the in, in the, the the very fertile zone of the sort of first hundred years before you before you get the first monarch that becomes sort of, uh, the first monarch who takes refuge in Buddha Dhamma and Sangha. We have the the um, the you you getting Buddhist monastics as uh, appointed as uh, peers of the realm. You have what they call the the um, lords uh, uh, lords secular and lords spiritual. So bishops have a place in the house of lords. So um, there are only Buddhists there yet, <laughs> but probably within the next fifty years or so that'll happen. And so then it, it'll become really mainstream. People will start to enter into into monastic life or take up Buddhism because of the social credentials that it provides. But that hasn't happened yet. It's still fringe enough. It's still um, off at the edges enough. So um, personally, I think you, you probably get about 100 years altogether. So you've got 60 good years to go before it becomes a um, sort of embedded in the, in the society and... Uh, and that's just you know, my own sort of rough guess of, of how these things might work. Uh, but this, uh, I think it's really valuable to be out on the fringes and to be a bit strange and to be um, not part of the um, uh, the kind of uh, familiar fabric of the society. Because uh, everybody who's here is uh, is here because of their own motivation. Yet no one is here because they were pressured by their parents. Time for you to go and live in a monastery. I, I'm not reading anybody's mind. I don't, I don't study your data sheets, but I can pretty much guarantee no one is here because mum and dad said, you should go and spend time in the monastery. Time for you to shave your head. You know, <laughs> it doesn't happen in the West. So, um, it, you know, within the next hundred years, you'll, you will get that. You'll get people who are sort of pushed into the monastery or into, uh, into the Buddhist way of life. Um, for more secular or worldly reasons, but um, we're not there yet, I and mean, I think we're, we're a long way from that. So that, uh, to me, it's um, it's a little bit more physically comfortable. We haven't got the place filled with dry rot, but there's enough uh, enough drafty and and, un, uh, and uncomfortable aspects to to life that we can still not settle down too much and get too complacent. Does that answer your question? Yes, can you get the microphone? Hello, Arjan. Um, you mentioned um, sort of um, monastics moving on and you mentioned also um, the rate in which you learn how fast and how slow you mm -hmm. learn um, the question is is um, what have you seen that shows someone um, learn the lessons quickly and what less what sort of things have you seen where you think oh they're not getting it because of such and such. I'm not sure if that question makes sense, actually. But, yeah, just from your experience, what have you sort of seen that shows somebody's... Um, mm, getting it, yes, <laughs> and not getting it, thank you. <laughs> uh, it's a good question. I, I try not to judge people uh, for the, exactly, the same, exactly the reasons I was describing, because appearances can be very deceptive and that uh, and in the past where there have been occasions where i thought wow you know that person's there they're really quick on the uptake and like oh my goodness you know he settled in really fast and then oh he's gone already oh right well yes <clears throat> indeed <laughs> so it can be very deceptive so i try not personally i try not to judge um and that, uh, and sometimes people say, "Oh, this is really great. This is my best place in the world, and I'm really getting a lot of monastic life." And so I'm going to go home. Oh, <laughs> I, did. I thought you just said this was really great, and you're doing really well. Yeah, this is really great. This is the best place, and I'm doing really well. But I think it's time for me to go home. Okay. 
So you um, you can't really um, make reliable and dependable judgments, I find. But it's general in response to your question. It's generally that people are not just having less suffering, but more that they are much more capable of working with their suffering. Because um, somebody can have a lot of like you can painful practice with slow result. <laughs> it can be really hard work. But if when talking with someone, um, you're seeing, okay, it's really difficult for this person, but um, they, they're, they're working hard with their, with their experience of dukkha, and that they are, they're learning from that. That they are, they're, working, they're ready to work with uh, the difficulties that are there, rather than just wallowing in it, or blaming others, or just sort of shutting down, and, or spacing out. And, but that sense of, um, of, a, of a, oh, they're, you know, they're, they're really sincere, they're really dedicated to, and, and, and um, working as best they can with the, the difficulties that, that they're meeting. So, so that's, again, you can't, <laughs> Tatiyampi, you can't make assumptions. Um, but generally, it's, uh, people are ready to acknowledge du the, the dukkha that they're experiencing and the readiness to work with it. And whether it's a lot or a little it is a bit more secondary. That's, I, I would say, is the, the, the key characteristic. But uh, yeah, it's um, it, it's very deceptive. So, uh, and and I, I personally, I just don't. Uh, after a few of the, the those kind of judgments I made a number of years ago, that was sort of back in the early days of, of Amravati or Chithurst, and uh, I think I've learned from then. Because I also I wasn't in the role of teaching, and so I wasn't so much sitting down with people and hearing what they were talking about in terms of their practice. Uh, uh, and so you, you didn't really hear so much of what was going on within. Uh, but I'm more in the, the role of, of teaching and uh, um, having conversations directly with people about their spiritual life. And so that then um, that is a bit more informative and you have a bit more of a complete picture. Could you use a microphone? Just so that everyone can hear the question. I really didn't get the bit about the fourth lotus being food. Uh, turtle food, so that it's a oh, turtle food. turtle food. Okay. So that it does, it never even flowers under the water. I thought you said total food. Tur turtle. Turtle. Tur turtle. Turtle food. <laughs> Yeah, it's like one of those blessed of the cheese makers. You could, you could take it away. Why is that total food? It's, it's nour the most nourishing thing is to be the one that never flowers at all. And you could, one could create a whole philosophy around that. <laughs> okay, I'll continue. Uh, Roger asks, as abbot of Chithurst, how do you advise your monks to view ceremonies and rituals that might seem rather remote from the actual practice? So I also note the, the way he asks the question presumes a certain that ceremonies are not the actual practice. So there is a presumption, I would respectfully point out, that is there in the way, in the way he asks the question. Lumpur responds, I personally like rituals. They are pleasant, they are quite pleasant to do. They're calming. One does them with a group of people. It's doing something that is pleasant, together, and in unison. The intention is always good, to radiate kindness, and to chant the teachings of the Buddha in Pali. Ceremony tends to uplift and inspire the minds of many people. That is its only function, as far as I can tell. I think it makes life much more beautiful. I've seen Dhamma communities which don't have ceremonies. They're a bit gross, actually. Gross? Gross. People just don't have a sense of etiquette, a kind of refinement, a lovely movement, the sense of time and place that one has when one, when un, one understands the value of precepts and ceremonies. They have their beauty. The bhikkhu's life is a kind of dance one does. One learns to move. The life has its own beautiful form, 
which is a way of training the physical form in beautiful movement, the mental and the physical combined. However, it's not an end in itself. It can become silly if it's an end in itself, and it's not necessary either. If it doesn't fit or if people don't want it, then it shouldn't be used. It's something one can use or not use according to time and place. If one has never used ceremony or doesn't understand its purpose, when one is faced with a ceremony, one might reject it, thinking, I don't like it, or ceremonies are wrong. But they aren't. There's nothing wrong with ceremonies. To feel one should not have ceremonies is just as much an opinion as to feel one should. It's not a matter of having to say one should or shouldn't have them. They are a part of our tradition, so we use them, if they are appropriate. If they're not appropriate, we don't use them. This is a matter of knowing rather than having opinions. So very, very much a case in point now, since we have the COVID-19 uh, social distancing, we're not allowed to spray uh, our devotion into the air, but uh, just keep it internal. And um, so right now, a lot of chanting is not, uh, is not appropriate. So we have very, uh, I've never lived in a monastery with, uh, with such a minimal um, ceremonial devotional uh, lifestyle uh, as we have done during this last year or so since, since late March. We just think the the chanting, uh, uh, the Anamodana at the uh, at the meal time, and then uh, the the Parisha chanting on a Sunday morning. That's that's it for the uh, apart from the closing homage uh, at the end of the morning and evening meditation. So it's it's very very minimalistic at the moment. But that's that's the the pattern of of life at this time uh, as necessitated by the by the pandemic so um, i'm i'm sure a few of us will think oh it'd be nice to do more chanting i'm looking forward to when we can do more chanting together because of the inspiring and energizing quality of it but uh, as lumpur points out um, if it uh, if it doesn't fit or it's not uh, it's not essential um, then we can leave it aside and so that that kind of flexibility in relationship to it and seeing it as a, a skillful means, then that's that's really a part of it. And again, I think that uh, Roger Wheeler was, was struggling a lot with his own life in the Tibetan uh, monastic tradition and also perhaps from the, the way that things have been put across to him in terms of um, what you should do as a as a, a gelong, as a as a, a monk in the Tibetan tradition, and the the value or importance or essential quality of ceremonies and, and such like. So, or, or, as he goes along, he's getting a, continually getting a, a a different perspective on both the Vinaya discipline and the the ceremonial ritual aspect of, of one's life, and then. Um, the uh, as we go along, he's sort of getting more and more of the. The perspective from from Lumpur um, of a, a very different ways to relate to form and tradition and uh, these kind of structures. Okay, so to continue, how do you view your role as abbot? How do you how do you see yourself as a figure of authority at Chithurst? Lumpur responds, well. I really don't think about it. <laughs> I act very much like the abbot. It's my nature to appreciate dignity and hierarchical structures. I don't find them unbearable. Actually, I find the role of abbot great fun. It's a pleasant position to be in. It has its disadvantages in the sense that you get everything thrown at you, but I quite like serving others too. Uh, I like to go back and be number 10 in the line. In Thailand, it's very nice to be nobody without always having to be up front in everybody up in front of everybody however our training is to adapt not to choose it was not easy to be an abbot at first it was difficult for me to accept that position because many feelings because many feelings of inadequacy and self-doubt arose so i penetrated those feelings i worked with them making them my meditation object to the point where my position became easy for me I adapted to the position rather than believing the thought, oh, I'm not ready for this, or oh, I don't want to do this. So, uh, yeah, I think Ajahn Chandasuri and I were both there at Chithurst. It was very evident Lumpur was comfortable in the role of, <laughs> of leadership. And uh, he, uh, as he said, uh, he found the, the role of Abbot great fun. He's, even though he would say, quite often he'd say, actually, I'm really a shy person. 
it, almost pretty much everyone in the room would go, shy? Uh, because he seemed to be so confident and, and, com and comfortable in front of everybody and, and in that sort of leading position. Um, but uh, it, it was something that he uh, he could do very, very well and has served uh, uh, the um, the lives of many, many of us, uh, uh, and hundreds, thousands and thousands of us over over the years that he has been ready to take up that central position and to, to lead and to, to speak from that. Um, but just uh, prior to this, in early 81, I think January, February of 1981, he'd been back to Thailand. I think you were on that trip as well. And so um, that would have been the first time he was actually able to sit in a line of, of monks and not be number one for a long time, that he was uh, not so senior when joining with the community in in Thailand, and that had just been three or four months before he was there in the in the states with uh, with Roger Wheeler. He um, he did shy away from taking responsibility for being in a leadership role. So when he says it was difficult for me to accept that position, he was the first Westerner to to go and train with Ajahn Chah, and um, and so when uh, he arrived in 1967 uh, at Wat Pong. Um, and then he was there uh, on his own for some time. And then a few other Westerners came along. Jack Cornfield um, was a monk there for uh, some time. Uh, a man called Douglas Burns was there um, uh, as a monk for some time. Chris Cook, uh, uh, Damaguto was there in the, that same uh, very early 70s. And then uh, a few more came along, um, 72, 73. So that was when uh, it was uh, Ajahn Pabakaro, Ajahn Santajito, Ajahn Pasano, Ajahn Kemadamo, the... Or they all came in the early 70s. So uh, as a, a larger group of Westerners started gathering, then uh, Lumpo Cha would regularly ask Ajahn Sumedho to be the translator or to take responsibility for, for guiding the, uh, the others. And I think it was in the, the, the Rains Retreat of 1972, he sent them all off to Tamsang Pet, which is a branch monastery, um, about 40, 40 miles or so um, north of uh, Wapapong in the little air, uh, province of Amnat Charun. And uh, it was a branch monastery with a, 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 a um, it was unusual and it had a, a hill uh, um, uh, and stood up from the, the plain of northeast Thailand. And so that uh, the, the Westerners were sent out there and uh, 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 Lumpur Thun, who spent the rains retreat here, uh, not last year, but the year before. Um, he was the abbot um, of the upper monastery there on the top of the hill. And then also uh, Lumpur Liam, who's now the abbot of Wat Bapong, uh, Lumpur Cha sent him along as well as a sort of uh, mentor and, and so, uh, support. Um, but that was the first time that uh, Ajahn Sumedho was in the position of, of leading a, a group of, of Westerners together. And so there was about five or six of them all at, at Tamsang Pet. And that was really quite a struggle for him. So as soon as the rains retreat was over, he found a really good reason to be somewhere else and it took off for central Thailand. And um, so that uh, it, it took him some time to, to sort of get, uh, get into that, that role, uh, uh, into that role of teaching and leading. And as he said, it was difficult for me to accept that position because of many feelings of inadequacy and self-doubt. And so um, that... Uh, um, that was the first time that he was in a position of leadership in the monastic life. And then he, uh, after he'd, he'd gone away and then um, went to central Thailand, he went on pilgrimage to India. And then, as many of you will have, have heard him mention, or you see in his other Dhamma books, it was when he was traveling in India in that time. I think that was 70, uh, uh, 73 or early 74. Um, then this very profound gratitude uh, rose up within him and he really, uh, really sort of felt sort of down to his bones um, the um, appreciation, gratitude for what he'd received from Lumpur Char, from the tradition and, and it was a real change of heart for him. So when he got back from India, went back to Wat Bapong, then he, he offered himself to Lumpur Char saying, whatever you want me to do to help, uh, you, know, just, you just tell me and I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be ready to, to do it. Uh, and so sort of gave him, uh, offered his life for Lumpur Cha to, to use uh, in whatever way he could serve. And then it was um, in the uh, early 75 
then that um, he went off with a uh, with a group of other Westerners, and then they were passing, they were going off to to do the bowl firing, and they went to um, the forest at Bungwai, uh, and uh, the village is there. It's only about six or seven miles away from from Wapapong, not not too far, but they they went to uh, camped out there in the forest, uh, and uh, the villagers asked them if they could stay, and so then that was the foundation of what by Nana Chat. And then the villagers very quickly built a couple of kutis and a small grass roof sala, and they uh, they got permission for the westerners to stay there. So the the very first rains retreat at Wananachat was 1975. So by that time, then uh, uh, the Lumpo Sumedo was a bit more ready to be in the uh, leadership role, and uh, had sort of uh, taken that taken that on. But he still uh, had. Um, I uh, say so it was still a, a bit of a, a challenging time for him, but he um, he stuck with it, as we know. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, and so that uh, it was, um, uh, he, um, say, by the time he got to, to Chithurst and was leading the community there, that was um, uh, 1977. He came to England, and then 79, Chithurst opened. So he'd been in that role of leading a community of Western monastics for um, for quite some time. He had five or six years by then. So he started in 75 at, at Nanachat, and then this was 1981 when he has this this interview. Becoming attached to the role of abbot would also be an easy thing to do. That is, taking oneself to be someone important. If one is mindful, one is checking and watching. These things are just the changing conditions of samsara. Sometimes one is the abbot, sometimes the servant. Everything changes. If one has no preferences, one has no suffering when conditions change. But if one is determined not to be an abbot or to take a position of responsibility, one suffers when conditions arise when one is supposed to do that. On the other hand, if one wants to be someone important, but is only number 10 in the line, one also suffers because of feeling resentful and jealous of those who are above one. So one ha also has to watch for that. The point of the Buddha's teaching is to have that awareness of suffering. Everyone suffers, so we all have to watch for this. The point is not to choose any position in the line as mine. One has to be able to move up or down, uh, or not at all, depending on time and place. So uh, yeah, I'm reminded also of um, during that first rains retreat at, uh, at Wat Nanacha when there was uh, things were were um, were getting really difficult for uh, for the uh, the new abbot uh, Ajahn Sumato and he went over to Wat Bapong and um, he was in a very um, sort of sad and disheartened state and Lumpur <laughs> Lumpur. Uh, Characteristic, he kind of looked at him and said, Oh, Sumato is suffering. <laughs> yeah, he was suffering in the role of abbot. He said, You thought being the abbot was just having a big triangular cushion. You can just sort of lean back and, and everyone will do just exactly what you say. Yeah. And he was kind of laughing, but also sympathizing with him, apparently. Uh, obviously, I wasn't there. I was still a, um, a, a hairy student in London at that point. Um, but. Um, uh, uh, that, uh, Lumpucha understood the situation exactly. He said, "You know, you uh, you you have ideas about what people are, uh, are supposed to do, and you 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 kind of put the word out, you give instruction, but then people just do their own thing. They they go their own way. Everyone's different." He said, and then he made this analogy. It says, "Like you 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 want everyone to 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 f to follow the, the 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 routine and practice um, according to the instruction and you you get everyone to line up you, you it's like you lie them down on the ground and you you get all their feet lined up so all their feet are in a nice straight line and everyone is uh, everything is is orderly but then you look at their heads and their heads are all kind of zigzag they kind of because they're all different heights then you get you, you move them so all the heads are lined up okay now they're all tidy and neat all the heads are lined up and oh no the feet are out of order now so this is this is the way people are, and so uh, and Lumpur Sumato often had uh, repeated that advice he got from Lumpur Cha, and uh, so that uh, he um, uh, he has you know, learned over time that you have a always have a big variety of, of people, and and when when you say um, let's do this, some people say yes, other people say no, and then there will be a <laughs> everybody in between. 
but um, but I do feel that this uh, principle of um, uh, adaptability is very important and, and if you see that you you're really shy of leading then uh, it's really a stretch if you are in that set, that sort of leading position then it's good from time to time to to be in that that place just to think <laughs> i can't do it i oh, know not me not me not me i can't do it to to be able to work with that i can't do it i'm not good enough uh, isn't there someone i can hide behind to to be able to work with that um or uh, uh, and uh, if the things are different and you're always following and there's always somebody else who's in that central position that well, what about me I, well when i'm when i'm abbot of the monastery then i will when i'm the senior nun when i when then i'm gonna and uh, you feel uh, eager to get into that position or resentful of people who are out there um, being in that that central role then uh, again it's, it's useful to look at that uh, that uh, that kind of position or or uh, if you are you know, way down in the line, oh, thank goodness I'm down here, it's safe down here. Yes, there's plenty of people in front of me. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> that's a very dangerous thought. Even if you're the last Anagarika, it's like, oh, I'll be years before I'm anywhere near the front. You blink and a, a decade goes by. So it, um, it's a, a dangerous thought to be taking refuge in uh, where you happen to be landing in the line. And so, and I would say that uh, developing those skills over time is really very, very beneficial. So when it's time to lead, you lead. When it's time to follow, you follow. And just learning to, to adapt and, and fit in with the, um, the situation as you find it. So any thoughts, questions, comments? Yes. Tanarindo, can you pass in the mic? It's behind you. Yes, Ajahn, I was uh, wondering that Vasa in Tom Sang Pet, mm -hmm. and that first was a for Long Porsomero leading. Um, you described a little bit that he was having difficulties there with the other Westerners. Did he ever share with you more details about kind of what, were, were they undermining his authority? Were they fighting with each other? Like what, what in particular was it that um, made it so difficult? Were they just not listening to him or they wanted to do things differently? Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. Uh, one one of the things was that two of the novices took LSD and asked him to sit with them while they were tripping. He was not happy with that. It was a completely outrageous thing to for them to have done. But you know, once the once the drug was in the system, then you know those things go on for hours and hours. So. That was a challenge he could have done without. And then there was the, uh, all the sort of the aftermath of that. And um, uh, I think the, um, the, the degree to which uh, people had their own uh, opinions about how to practice and then they were getting to to um, uh, spend a lot of time and energy uh, discussing slash arguing about what were the right what the right ways to practice were and such like I, i'm not uh, i mean it, when lumpur gets here it'd be a good question to ask him but i think that from my um understanding of the conversations with people who were there so some, some of the people who were <laughs> with lumpur at that time um uh, that uh, there was there was a lot of um, the kind of uh, opinionating, position taking. This is the right practice. That's the wrong practice. You should, we should be doing this. We shouldn't be doing that. This is the right way to do it. This is the wrong way to do it. And then a lot of tendency to attach to opinions and just take positions and and um, so that uh, I think that seems to have been a, quite a strong characteristic of those first Westerners because really they, they didn't. They didn't have anyone to compare themselves to. They didn't have any other Western mentors apart from, really from, from Ajahn Sumato. And then uh, Dhamma, uh, Venerable Dhammaguto, Chris Cook, was also more, he was one of the more experienced ones who was there. He'd, he'd come in a, like an earlier group about 1970, 71. So he'd had a bit more experience. 
but many of them are just very prone to uh, uh, being self-righteous and opinionated and and uh, and spending a lot of time and energy on on, you know, on that which uh, to uh, to lump Sumedha was really missing a lot of the point of what they were there for but yeah you know, he should be here in 10 days <laughs> But when he's arrived and settled in and we have opportunities to engage, then that would be a good question to ask. Because apart from the LSD trip, I, I'm not sure of any of the, the details, but I think that was a, a big enough splash in the community to have its effect for quite a few weeks. So, so in terms of them, um, see, I was wondering, if, would they, maybe he, he hasn't shared this, but... Um, see him as an equal and because he was quite junior kind of maybe wanting to uh, just not respect him but i mean i guess i can ask him when he comes um yeah again i, I don't want to guess too much many of them were americans and so having a very sort of egalitarian mentality and um would uh, wouldn't have really looked up to him as a teacher or that or the seniority wouldn't have meant so much um and so that that um but i, I think uh, that sense of him in a way having to be responsible and then people not not listening to what he was not taking his lead or not following his his guidance that was i think just very frustrating and also as he points out in this this interview that his own feelings of inadequacy like that he didn't uh, and necessarily feel like he was that much of an expert or he wasn't Lumpur Cha. Lumpur Cha was not there and so he's he's a hard act to follow and that also that say well Lumpur, Lumpur wouldn't want us to do that or Lumpur said this or Lumpur does that or, and that that's something that very easily happens when you've got a very powerful strong and clear um, principal teacher and that they're, they're not around and that's it. and so you would you would uh, and someone who's sort of stepping into the role and they get well, compared to the to the te the, the teacher like, say well, well Lumpur Chao, you know Lumpur wouldn't have us do that or like uh, I heard Lumpur say something different or like that's wrong you know he didn't say that he said this and so finding fault and and what and going along with their own opinions and then also I think because of the, the not to typecast Americans but uh, it there, there's a, a uh, in America, your uh, your conditioning in terms of your education and the society is very much to sort of, to give voice to your own opinions and to self righteousness is praised. You, know, you should you know, be self righteous. I mean, maybe Ajahn Kachana might correct me on that, but uh, he's a but <laughs> it's it's a strong. Uh, you know, you're actually you're encouraged to sort of stand up and voice your opinions and stick to them and, and and fight for your opinions and so that kind of conditioning has its effect so even though uh, uh, Lumpur Sumedha was American too you know he'd been living in Thailand for uh, quite some time by then since 66 so it was uh, he'd been there for six or seven years seven or eight years and so he was he'd been quite strongly affected by the you know, Thai ways of, of thinking and, and, and monastic training so then it was it was hard to work with that uh, opinionatedness and and, uh, and also feeling that he, he couldn't couldn't live up to the standards of, of wisdom and, and, and ease that Lumpur Chah had you know, that was um, you know, as I say is a hard act to follow I mean not that you're trying to follow an act but <laughs> But he would also, or he would probably judge himself against what Lumpur Cha would have done, or how easily he would have handled it. And then you know, the, the comment that he made about um, being an abbot—you have everything thrown at you. Um, yeah, I find the role of abbot great fun. It's a pleasant position to be in. It has its disadvantages in the sense that you get everything thrown at you. That takes quite a bit of ex experience, where you're people um, are asking you to solve their problems or they're blaming you for things that are difficult for them that you know d decisions you've made or, or structures you set up that they're finding challenging or painful or you, they don't agree with so Yilun Pucha would use this example he said is the, the, you know the you think of the abbot or uh, the ajahn as being in the central position you get the big 
the big cushion to lean against, <laughs> yeah, or, or a soft mat to sit on, and you think, oh, this is easy. You know, just sit, sit there and, and tell people what to do and you know, and have a, a comfy spot to, to park yourself. But he said, really, it's not just the, uh, being a, the Ajahn, it's not a comfortable position. It's really your job is to be the rubbish pit for everyone to throw all, the, all their, their garbage into. And in the old days in Thailand, the, the way a rubbish pit would work, there would be about three meters by three meters square and about uh, about three or four meters deep. And because most of the things that the villagers used in the old days were biodegradable, just like bamboo and banana leaves, and um, that no matter how much stuff you threw into the into the pit, it would never fill up. It would rot away. It was a and sort of went far enough down to be close to the water table, so that you could keep throwing stuff in, and it would never, it would never get full. So, being the rubbish pit um, for everyone to throw their, their their garbage into is really the abbot's job, or the you know, if you're an ajahn, that. And the the idea is you don't get filled up. <laughs> Nowadays, with plastic and non-recyclable stuff, the, the, it, things get filled up much more quickly. But in the old days, that was part of the, of the imagery of it: is that it would, that no matter how much of people's sort of debris you received, you would still be empty. You know, there, was, there would, you wouldn't be overwhelmed or filled up by that. But that takes quite a lot of skill. And a lot of experience to to be in that position to to be receiving people's projections, or um, you know, it, also it can be the, their appreciation. Sometimes uh, it's not all just criticism and difficulty the, or problem solving, but for some people, being praised and being loved is harder than being criticised and blamed. You might be surprised, but for, for some people, the, having people really appreciate you and love you. And uh, and uh, and say that they 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 really uh, are um, sort of dependent on you. They can, oh, don't say that. That's that's worse than people complaining about you making stupid decisions or making their life uh, complicated for them. So, but that that is uh, it just takes years and years and years of being in that kind of a of a role and, and learning not to take it personally. And I think that this was really the first time he was in that role. And so, I would imagine, just like for myself, you know, um, you take it very personally, <laughs> and it's very hard to do to receive people's criticism or praise or 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 people's anguish. You know, that help me, help me, help me. I can't, I can't deal with this. You've got to do something. You've got to help me. I, I can't, I can't handle this. Please help me, help me. And there might be you know, nothing that you can really do. And but again, you know, you're in the role of, of receiving that and having to, to work with that. So it's it's a challenging role to be in. And you can't just get it out of a book. <laughs> it's a, it's hundreds or thousands of hours of, of being in that kind of a mode uh, before you, you really... Uh, there's a way of being at ease with that. But I see that it's now gone to eight minutes past seven, so time to wrap up for today.